Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm from Canada and before coming I talked to my wife and I wanted to say that my vision for America is to be more like Canada. She told me not to say it, so I said I won't. But then I figured I'd mention it before the talk. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa tabi'in wa tabi'in lahum bi ihsan wa hudan ila yawmiddin. Alhamdulillah, if we look forward, as Sheikh Yasser mentioned, if we're standing up on a hill, we've come a long way, and an, an unimaginable way from where our parents came to in every way. And we're looking forward of where we want to go as a community. There's one thing that we have to commit ourselves to, and that one commitment is a commitment to ihsan, a commitment to excellence, that as a community and as an individual, we have to be committed to do the best thing in the best way for the best of motives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed excellence in all matters. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that verily Allah loves that if any of you does anything, they do it with excellence. And there was a very powerful moment. One of the leading scholars of the Muslim Ummah, he came to Toronto a year and a half ago and he was talking in a auditorium of a girl's school, a girl's Islamic school. And the heating wasn't working in the auditorium and it was freezing cold, it was winter. And they just put blankets around the sheikh. The sheikh's in his 70s. And there's actually, you could hear the dripping of water somewhere in the auditorium, it was sort of echoing drips of water during the talk. And he made this point that as a community, we have to take this very seriously that anything we do, whether as individuals or the community, we have to strive to do it with excellence. Because this is the ex essence of the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that verily Allah loves that if any of you does anything, they do so with excellence. And he said that unless we do this, unless we are committed to excellence, will be a fitna, will be a test, both for the members of our own community and for society at large. Because when he said when you do things, short of excellence, short of people's expectations, you are effectively calling them away from whatever you're trying to call them to. So for example, if as a community, we can't figure out how to keep masjid toilets clean, and it would seem to be one of the great mysteries of life, that how do you keep a toilet clean? I actually had a surreal event I conducted a seminar on lessons from the life of the Prophet before his prophethood. And there's many pertinent lessons, but I didn't expect that in the question and answer session, the most important question, and it lasted 40 minutes, there's a discussion that was taking place. That how do you keep the masjid toilet clean? And I've never done it, to be honest. I've never cleaned masjid toilets. But it seemed as if it's the most difficult of matters. Apparently the mosque had a disagreement. The president of the mosque had a, an, an attitude that everyone has to keep the mosque clean by themselves. If you use it, keep it clean. The executive wanted to have some kind of system in place, but they didn't know what. And people at the mosque were very upset. I later found out why, because before Maghrib prayer, I had to use the washroom. And it's not that difficult, right? And the way you do it is that you have to be committed that anything you do, whether as an individual or, or as this community, we have to do it in the best of ways. How do we do it in the best of ways? We have to find out what are the standards of excellence in doing something, and we do them. And those standards of excellence, we have to look at how other people do things and learn from them. And then look also at our tradition. 
what does the Quran and Sunnah tell us about this matter and to be committed to do it in the best of ways as individuals it starts with a commitment that we will not merely go through the motions of our religion but that anything we do of our own religious practice we do it with excellence we shouldn't just pray we should strive to pray with excellence learn how we can pray as the Prophet ﷺ prayed not just outwardly but try to bring some of the inward reality of turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into our prayers similarly in our conduct we shouldn't just say well you know I'm just trying not to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but rather how can I be a believer who upholds excellence in my conduct in my character it requires knowledge and it requires a commitment that I'm going to do everything in the way most pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but as a community within we have to look at what is excellence in our community we should not just have mosques right you ask people if you go to a community that what are you trying to do what's we're just trying to run the mosque and do what with it nothing we're just trying to keep the mosque afloat no we should strive for excellence that we're trying to have a mosque that will be an example of excellence how well think about it how can we run this mosque in a way that will be most pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how can we run this mosque in a manner that will be of the greatest benefit both to our community and to the society we're in similarly you know you go to a Muslim high school and ask what are you trying to do well we're trying to teach Muslim kids and what are you trying to achieve with it and there's no clear sense of purpose anything we do as a community we have to be committed to do it with excellence and what is excellence for us religiously excellence would be doing it or striving to do it in a manner that it be, that would be pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that would be of the greatest and widest and most lasting benefit both to our community and to society at large and then to think deeply how we can achieve that in whatever we're doing because sloppiness is not from the sunnah that Allah has decreed that if you do anything you do it in the best of ways and that requires certain things as a community we have to be committed to cooperating in righteousness and piety it, it, because we don't have this sense of seeking excellence very often you find in a large urban area people who are doing very much the same thing on opposite sides of the town they're not in communication with each other even friends right? people who have no differences amongst themselves but because they don't have a concern that whatever I'm trying to do I'm trying to do in the best of ways then everyone will just do their own little thing and just try to keep that afloat whereas you need one another if you're trying to strive for excellence so that is one aspect of it the other aspect is that never just do something that anything you do find out what is the best way of doing things very often many of us have professional backgrounds that could inform our Islamic efforts and help imbue them with excellence I went to one program somewhere on the East Coast and the person who was coordinating the program works for one of the leading management consulting companies in North America and he's a senior consultant and very successful but then we went the program started they said oh you know we forgot to get a screen for the projector so would you mind if we just put papers on the wall so we can project your presentation so I'd be giving the seminar and one of the sisters would put up her hand and she just point you know at the back and I had to go and like you know stick the pieces of paper back on the wall right and this the person who organized the event is a professional who has the life skills the professional skills to, to act differently but we have the business suit that we wear to work right and then we have the kufi that we put on that sort of changes our attitude I asked my brother who's in ma who's studied management and finance as well it sort of runs in the family and I asked him Fez 
Why are so many halal meat stores so smelly? And he said, Bhai, you have to understand that it has to do with an attitude. I said, what do you mean? He said, look, normally we would never go to a place that was smelly and dark and had this sort of funny smell to it. But we find a certain degree of comfort because it reminds us of home. Right? It reminds us of, of back home. Because I, I didn't understand, like, where, where we live in Mississauga, you know, you can call it like Mississauga Bad, right? In, in Toronto, it's one of the suburbs of Toronto. There's, if, if I check on, Zabi, on the Zabiha app on the iPhone, there's 54 halal establishments between restaurants and halal meat stores within a 10 kilometer radius of my house. But why are the ones that are smelly and dirty? so popular why don't they go out of business right because we don't expect excellence in our community we just sort of go through the motions and in that sometimes we find comfort in these things but that's not the that's not the way we may f find comfort in it because we're used to being part of a certain way of doing things but there's many people within our community for whom our mosques are a fitna not just because of what is said on the mimbar, but rather even simple things, even the door of the mosque can sometimes be a fitna. I have a friend of mine, he came from Washington State and he, he came to Toronto and, and his, his mother is a judge, a fascinating brother. He prayed at one of the large centers in Toronto and then he came over to my place and I said, how was it? He said, you know, it was very troubling. I asked him why. He said, just entering the masjid made me feel very heavy. And I asked him why. He said, well, because I was going for Isha. It was dark outside. You opened the door. I couldn't open the front door properly. So I thought the masjid, it might be locked. But open another door. It was, again, it was hard to open the door. Went inside. It was dark. I took off my shoes. My socks got wet. And it was winter. It's, you know, you don't want your socks wet in winter. And there's a funny smell to the masjid. And I just felt very constrained. And he's not used to this. Right? He's not used to this. For many people, just entering the mosque is actually a da'wah away from the mosque. Because any public space you go to has certain standards. Right? It's welcoming. It's well lit. It will normally smell good, rather, you know, let alone you know, have any sense of smelling musty or bad. Right? You won't see shoes on the ground when you enter a public building, except a mosque. Right? And this is a da'wah against so many people in the community. They don't consciously say, I'm staying away from the mosque. But they do. Right? Because we don't have a commitment to do things in the best of ways. And when we do, there's many ways you can run a mosque with excellence. There's many ways you can run a mosque with excellence, that you can run an Islamic school with excellence. Part of the commitment to excellence is to look at our successes. And we don't do that. It's very easy to see the faults in the community, but if you look right across North America, there's amazing stories of success in our community. We've come a long way. But part of a commitment to excellence is to see the stories of excellence that we have in our own communities. Amazing projects like the Ummah Clinic in South Central. Right? So there's so many Muslim doctors who are concerned that how can I contribute to society? How can I be of use to my own community? And you mentioned the Ummah Clinic, they haven't even heard of it. So part of the commitment to excellence is that we have to find out about the success stories within our own community and share them, to share the best practices so that others can be inspired to do the same thing or at least to take ideas. I was talking to some doctors in, in, in Philadelphia and just mentioned the Ummah Clinic and said, how do, we, how do we start something like this in Philadelphia? I said, well, I don't know, right? I don't understand anything about medicine, alhamdulillah. But there's a working model of a successful free Muslim clinic. Why don't you talk to them? 
Maybe invite them over to conduct a seminar on how to establish a Muslim free clinic or whatever else you do, be committed to do it with excellence. And then in our efforts, we have to have a sense of purpose. We have to have a sense of purpose. And the sense of purpose, a beautiful example of what we try to do as believers is encapsulated in, this, in the istikhara, right? In the istikhara. The, this dua that we make when we seek to make a decision, right? Some, some people think it's some kind of magic wand that you know, if, you're, if you want to marry, you know, suspend your judgment, don't think about what's the right choice to make, just make this dua, wake up, and if you woke up on the right side of the bed, marry her, right? Or marry him. I get asked religious questions on and off by email, and often I get asked that my marriage didn't work, even though I prayed istikhara, right? But if you just reflect on the words of the istikhara, how do we strive to make decisions? That you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because you acknowledge that He knows and you don't, that He's aware and that you're unaware and that He's all powerful. You ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you make the decision that is best for your worldly life and for your religious life in the short term and in the long term, in ways that you are aware and in ways that you aren't aware you know, directly and indirectly. But what are you trying to do? You're trying to do what will be of the greatest and widest benefit for yourself and for others in the immediate and in the long term, in your religion and in your worldly life. But we have to have that sense of commitment because otherwise we'll fall short of what we could achieve. If we have this commitment to excellence, then we would get together and say, okay, how do we do this? How do we do this in the best and most beneficial manner? The Prophet ﷺ said that the strong believer is better and more beloved to Allah than the weak believer. Though there's good in both. And who is the strong believer? A lot of things have been said about who the best of believers are. But one of the, the leading contemporary scholars, Mufti Rafi Usmani, he said something that almost inevitably when the Quran and Sunnah praise a quality, in the same context, you'll find a key to upholding that quality or that virtue. So the Prophet ﷺ praises the strong believer, that the strong believer is better and more beloved to Allah than the weak believer. Though there's good in both. Who is the strong believer? The Prophet ﷺ tells us, Ihris ala ma Be avid for all that benefits you. Right? That is the characteristic of the strong believer. The strong believer is avid for benefits in every way for themselves and for their community and for society. Not just short term, but long term. And in that, we, we aim for the highest of matters, right? Because we're seeking the greatest benefit. We don't just say, you know what, I'll just do a little and that's enough. No. وَاسْتَعِنْ بِاللَّهُ وَلَا تَعْجَزْ And rely on Allah and don't deem yourself incapable. When we strive for excellence, we don't just say, you know, We'd like to be a little better than, than average. You know, 2% better. Right? And 2% adds up. But strive for the, the greatest of good. Because then if you fall short, you still may be very good. And this requires serious planning. You go in the Muslim community and you ask people, what's your plan for, for your Islamic organization? They don't have one. They don't have one. They've not sat down and said, okay, how do we define success for ourselves? This should bring us a certain degree of optimism because even without trying to have a clear vision of how we will succeed, we've come this far. But we really need to sit down and define how will we be successful, both in our individual projects and together as an ummah, right? together as a community. One thing that's part of the excellence of Islam in America or Islam in North America is that we have to be clear on how we view ourselves with respect to society at large. And in this, we have to acquire the prophetic vision of looking at others. The Prophet ﷺ came at a time 
when corruption was widespread on the lands and in the sea by what the hands of men had wrought. Yet despite that, how did the Prophet ﷺ define it? How did the Prophet ﷺ define his mission? He didn't define his mission in a negative manner. He was aware of the problems that existed in society, yet he defined his mission in a very positive manner that I was only sent to perfect noble character, noble conduct. He saw nobility and good and virtue in society and, it, and he saw that people were, f were falling short of that potential of good and he saw the purpose of the message that he came with to raise people up to fulfill their potential. He saw the inherent possibility of good that other people had and his concern was to raise them up to fulfill their potential. He did not see them in so far as the bad that they had, in the shortcomings that they had. And this is very important that we have to look with that prophetic look, that sense of mercy. Because what is mercy? Mercy is seeking good with respect to another. The religion itself is sincere concern. Yeah, the Prophet said, Ad Deenun Nasiha, religion is sincere concern. It's sincere concern for Allah and His Book and His Messenger but also for other people, both leaders and their commonality. And this concern for the good is how we should be looking at others. When you see success in the long term, the first is that we need institutions of Islamic knowledge because this religion of ours is a religion of knowledge. The Prophet ﷺ said that whomever Allah wishes well for, He grants understanding of religion. And we can only excel as a community of faith if we have deep knowledge of faith in our community, we need, as Sheikh Yasser said, scholars who've been raised and educated in their deen in North America. We need institutions that produce the highest levels of scholarship. We need institutions that produce da'is and chaplains and teachers who aren't just able to teach or institutions that are as good as institutions in the Muslim world, but rather that, that are institutions of the highest of excellence. We may not achieve it in one step, but we have to go in that direction. And the second is we have to have a spirit of service, that part of that commitment to excellence is sincerity of concern for others. And it has to be manifest in our lives that in our own seeking of good, in our own commitment to excel as believers, in our commitment to be strong believers, where is the concern for excellence manifest in our own lives? It's very easy to be an armchair critic, to sit back and say, look, Zaytuna is not doing this, and Isna, look at what they're doing, and Al-Maghrib, look at them, and this group, and that group, and the other group. No, the question to ask ourselves is, that what are we doing to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What are we doing to be part of that vision for excellence for our community? What are we doing to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by benefiting other people in the short term and in the long term. And it requires a commitment from ourselves, a commitment to give of our time, a commitment to give of our money, a commitment to give of our concern, a commitment to deal with one another with love and with mercy, and to have a commitment to overlook the faults of one another, and a commitment to look at the successes of others in our community with the spirit of assisting them in what they're trying to do and in learning from them so that we too can strive for excellence. And if we do that, Alhamdulillah, we've come a long way in the Muslim community and there's a lot more to do. And if we hold hands together and commit ourselves to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to, to have a concern to, to, to success, to do things in the best of ways, we can expect the best of results. One of the greatest scholars of the 20th century who wrote a commentary on Sahih Muslim that many regard to be the best commentary on Sahih Muslim, Shaykh al-Islam Shabir Usmani, he said that if four things are true, everything we know in the Quran and Sunnah tells us that success is a divine guarantee. Your intention must be true. The goal that you are pursuing must be true. 
the way you pursue that goal must be true. And then you must pursue that goal in, in the best of ways. Right? So you have to have the right goal with the right intention and to pursue it in the right way. And then to keep up your excellence when you are pursuing it. And if we do that, success is a guarantee from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we're an ummah of success. Wherever Islam has gone, it has been successful. And there's no reason that we, can fall, we will fall short. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he grant us sincerity and success and that he make this the first step in us uniting to make a difference. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.